Um, Paul Smith is uh, the British men's fashion industry in this country. I suppose that's what British means. Um, actually, he's not just the British men's fashion industry. He is the, really the British fashion industry. Um, he's the only designer to begin to rival um, Armani, Gucci, Versace. Um, but one way he doesn't rival them is he doesn't claim ever to have wanted to be an architect. Or that he trained as one either. Um, he's been around. Um, he's been around for years and been exporting for years. But he's only um, recently been awarded um, a CBE and a Queen's Award to, uh, for export. Um, he's been given the um, British Designer of the Year Award five times and refused it every single time. Um, on the, I suppose, not unacceptable grounds that there isn't any British, fa uh, British fashion industry to accept it from. I mean, he is it. It's sort of kind of, sort of tautology or something. Um, perhaps his proudest award is to become a freeman of Nottingham, his home city. Um, they would have made him sheriff of Nottingham, but it has a slightly bad connotation. Um, because, of course, needless to say, he is effectively effectively the Robin Hood. Oh no, no that doesn't work. That's not working. Um, <laughs> he takes from the rich and uh, <laughs> um, anyway he's got uh, 160 branches in Japan. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what exporting is. Um, it takes from the rich and gives to, to give business to people of, of England, who are obviously, effectively, the poor. Um, um, I, his turnover is, I, 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 you know, I, I was working out that his turnover is something in the order of uh, ten, t in one year, ten times all the turnover of my company in all, the, all its entire life. So it's mind-boggling, basically. I mean, it's it, the... the, the I was going to say expletives deleted. Superlatives have to be deleted, otherwise my introduction would go on forever and, and also would be completely unlistenable to. Um, anyway, he has seven shops in London. He has uh, shops in Paris and New York and Singapore and Hong Kong and Seoul and, well, um, and he has 150 outlets, 160 outlets, 161, uh, 180 outlets in Japan. Um, it was 160 yesterday, it's now 180 today, <laughs> because, um, well, I call them shops. I call them outlets, he calls them shops, they call them shops. The reason they call them shops is that they take 1.7 million pounds average each, that, and that's, that's a little unit inside a department store. Um, some of you probably went to the, 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 the brilliant uh, True Brit exhibition at the Design Museum, and you will know, therefore, that his... Uh, design ethos is a, is a mixture of a love of uh, Savile Row tailoring coupled with uh, a pleasure in robot toys from uh, uh, Japan and obviously uh, 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 cycling gear uh, and rubber uh, uh, foul. Um, this, this kind of eclecticism which I uh, it's perhaps been forgotten that the, the British always claim to be pragmatic um, and they love self-deprecation, but it's the combination of the two that really counts. If you've got one without the other, um, God help you. Now, obviously, fashion is different to architecture, which is why I think it's safe to have Paul Smith here because he is effectively self-taught. He didn't go to go to school, and that obviously, as your president, I would encourage you to stay at this one. Um, but, um, and his muse is his wife, um, which is convenient, it stops any jealousy, but also, of course, in architecture, a muse is quite different. It's a short street, usually a cul-de-sac with small buildings in it, which we all get to do when we're, or hope to get to do when we're, we start out in architecture. Um, so, muses are quite different. And therefore, I think it's completely unincumbent on Mr. Smith to talk in any way about architecture at all this evening, and I hope and expect him to talk about the subject with which he is consummately brilliant, which is fashion design. Paul Smith.
Uh, there's some things on the television, then if you get bored, you can watch the telly. Um, I'm going to uh, talk, it's observations and, and other stuff, and uh, really it's just about um, observations and other stuff. Uh, this is my studio above the Covent Garden shop. Do you want to put, put the big lights down? Yeah. Great. Um, so, and you've noticed, may have noticed uh, several selected items here, uh, which I'll talk about as we, as we go along. Um, so, what, I'm try what this uh, talks about uh, at the beginning is just the fact that if you use your eyes, um, you, can, you can find inspiration in everything, and if you can't, then you're not looking properly. So that means, basically, it's all there if you want it. Um, so, for instance, uh, this map of Rajasthan um, was uh, the source of a lot of inspiration for me uh, because when I was visiting there, I just loved the colours of the, uh, that the ladies were wearing and that just went on to be a, a big influence for me in what we're seeing here. Um, the collection you're about to see on here, which... Uh, eventually goes into lots of colour. So the way these people were wearing their clothes was a big influence in the way I styled my show. Not this bit, but in a minute. That was the mad cow start of my show. <laughs> uh, I did a sort of mad cow beginning, and we had uh, chickens going cock a doodle -doo. It was in France. This, uh, we do two shows a year in France, and this was in a disused building. Uh, and we had 60 models, most of them were of pals of mine, from from England, and um, it was on three floors, and we st started off with moo cows. Um, so we're going on to just talk about things that I'm interested in. So a lot of people say, oh, well, how do you get your ideas? Where do your ideas come from? Especially with colour. They say, um, with colour, um, do you, you know, are you part of a, a colour association, or do you, do you get a consultant in? And I say, no, I just use my eyes, and colour com can come from anything. So, for instance, from a room setting, I picked up on these colours, which then, um, you know, became the colours that I used for knitwear, for T-shirts, uh, and became the basis of one of my seven collections uh, uh, I do twice a year. Um, the other thing was uh, Guatemala, the, the fabrics of Guatemala. And you don't necessarily have to go there, I mean, because you can actually just find things in, in books, you know. And this is uh, some of their traditional fabric, which then went on to inspiring all these fabrics which I made into shirts and to uh, shorts and trousers and all sorts of things and was massively successful, you know. And that's just through observing. Um, this is some of my early work and this was like um, 1982, so that's uh, taken obviously uh, influence of uh, either things seen, art deco, graffiti, uh, wall uh, painting, uh, anything like that. Uh, that, that was some of my early stuff, and it was when I was trying to break into the market and trying to work out how to be different to everybody else. Um, this, uh, which is um, the Alhambra Palace uh, in Granada, um, I was there, it says here, Al Alhambra Palace, Granada, and well, that was, um, th I got this shirt from that because I was there and I really liked the floor, so I thought, great shirt. <laughs> and that's, so that's how that came about. Um, colour is really important to me, and um, I, I start off um, always with colour. When I start a new collection, it's always about colour, and this is the boss of colour, as you all know. It's Matisse. This is the famous painting called The Snail. As you can see his shell and his little snail up on the top left corner, except that I think when I took the picture, I went a bit low. But you can nearly see the snail at the top. Um, Colour is really important to me. Uh, it's, it has to be the basis of, of, of a new collection when you're working with simplicity. So um, uh, what I do is, as I say, is just take colour from anything. If you look at the colour here, you can see, if you look at this here, um, you can see that as you put it with a different colour, it does lots of different things. So I'll go back again. So what I... Even though you're using the same colour uh, as your base, by adding a different colour as a stripe for a shirt, uh, as an embroidery for a tie, you can say different things. You can say, you know, sophisticated, you can say punchy, bright, you can say whatever you want uh, with colour. I couldn't think of anything to say there. Moody. <laughs> I'm a designer, you can say things like that. Moody. Right. So, the other thing about colour is you've always got to have classic colour in your collection. 
So um, navy and white, black and white, is always really important because um, the thing to do about uh, fashion design, you've got to have the balance between, uh, between things that will get you in the paper and, uh, and in the magazines and things that are going to sell. So classic colours are important. Um, and then what I call a new classic. So still quite easy to wear, but just changing a little bit. And then, you know, very sort of you know, softer, sportier colours. So never scare people too much with colour, but <coughs> always, always do colour. Now, this little chap here has been very important to me because... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, he's he's a, um, a, a horse in pyjamas, and uh, this is another drawing of him here. Um, what I like, what, why this was inspirational to me was the fact that, um, you know, he's obviously in the wrong colour. And the, what I do a lot, because I don't tend to do jackets with 17 zips or three arms like a lot of designers, they, d they have a worry about justifying the word designer. I am a designer, so I must do something sort of unusual. I remember one of the first jobs I ever did uh, as a stylist was I, I, I just came up with a shirt that was just very simple and the boss said to me, but it looks like a shirt. And I said, yeah, well it is a shirt, just simple shirt. And he said, well, you know, you're a designer, I want more than just that, you know. I said, well, it's in Sea Island cotton, it's got 22 stitches to the inch, it's got mother of pearl buttons, it's got a very soft collar, it's got deep armholes. And that was the point, it was simplicity, but it was all about the cut, the fabric and the way you made it. And that's why this is important, because basically this is a regular, what we call a duffel coat, or a Montgomery, they call it in Italy. Um, but I made it in the wrong colour, I made it in red. So, of course, it will be in the collection, it'll be in camel, in navy blue, but I'll also do it in red or bright blue. And that's just taking something, everyday thing, and just changing it. Same here, this is a Harris tweed jacket, you should normally find in a sort of... Uh, very sort of country colours like a rust or something and it's just changing it. So the next section is really all about um, doing things that are <laughs> <coughs> different. This was a suit that was in corduroy influenced by the policeman and um, of course when customers came into my showroom from shops all over the world, we sell in 39 countries around the world, um, they could find this corduroy suit in, uh, you know, a nice navy blue, a green, etc. But it's taking the regular suit, but just changing it again and, and adding it in colour. And these are all just versions of that. So this looks very normal now, but in 1982 when I did this, you know, just taking a cotton drill work shirt, which you would find in just navy blue, but doing it in orange was, you know, a big hot seller and did really well. Taking um, linen, which would traditionally be in beige, but changing the colour again. <coughs> so this is uh, wh when I was in China, uh, and just uh, just seeing the girl in her uniform, and I just loved the colour very much, and it just went on to be becoming a, a, an influencer for a suit that was... Uh, Eve Klein had a bit to do with it as well, I have to say. Uh, I went to the Eve Klein exhibition, and I saw the girl in China, and I thought blue. That's what I'm going to do, blue. And I did, and it was very successful. This is taking a Scottish fabric that is just like that, and um, just drawing a big pink line over it. And it was ever so successful. It sold really well. And uh, it was so it's taking something that's just very normal, but yes, just banging some colour over the top of it, and um, just turn it into something else. Um, same here, just nice colours, um, but back down to 82 again. So very normal these days, but very unusual then. Um, <coughs> taking a traditional, this is a coat, uh, this is somebody called Brian Ferry, who's a popular singer. And, um, <coughs> well, what? <laughs> a long time ago. This is a... Um, <laughs> sorry, you're not here tonight, are you, Brian? No. Um, this is a this coat is called the Epsom coat, which is a, a traditional British coat. Uh, as Pierre said earlier, I still have a love for Savile Row and traditionalism. So this is the typical Paul Smith trick, if you like. This is a, a, a coat that they wear to go to the horse racing in Epsom horse racing uh, course, and it's just taking a t very typical British style, but putting it in the wrong colour and just softening up the construction of it, so it's a lot easier to wear. 
Um, this was, um, you know, this just made things like this happen. You know, I just like the colour of those things, and I thought shorts. You know how you do, and um, so that was that. Um, I was in China, and the, uh, fish fish are very, very. Uh, uh, they're good luck in China, and I, I bought lots of things that, um, like these things, um, little things with eyeballs in, and. Um, then I, I took lots of pictures of fish, and then I ended up doing this because this is really nice. And uh, so that's just observing. And if anybody wants it, it is 47. No, it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> so that came from that. It gets better the lecture, don't worry. Um, so um, walking around Beijing. Um, just, uh, I got lots of ideas from Beijing. I got um, all the fish things. I did lots of fish ideas from there. Embroidery, photography from that. Um, from this uh, blanket here, I, I did a whole series of uh, clothing which had patch, patchwork on it. So just taking, see it, observing it, make a little note in my, uh, in my book. I can't draw um, very well. At all. Well, I can't really draw at all. And so I use these books all the time. And I just write notes in the books. And it just says... Patch, what? Well, oh, there is a drawing actually. Um, but basically, I just write high notch jacket or patchwork jacket or something like that. And then when I come back, I talk to my pattern makers um, and just describe what I want. And then hopefully they, they come about, you know, they, they do something about it. Designers work in lots of ways. I, I never had any formal training, so I can't really draw very well at all. So I do it all in words uh, and, and then work on. <coughs> Uh, what's called a toile, which is a little calico. You know, you make the jacket or the shirt in calico, pin it onto the stand and then say higher with the button or lower with the button or more shape. I mean, if you know Comme de Gasson, the, the Japanese label, Ray Karakubo, who's the boss of Comme de Gasson, she only works in that way. She, she doesn't draw uh, and she only works, she has 40, 40 toilists. Those are the people that make these calico things. And she just goes in and says, Pillowcases, and then leaves, and then, <coughs> and then they have to, and then she goes back a week later and see what they've done, and um, th and then they have to do things that are based on a pillowcase. I mean, she really does do that. I mean, I was there one day when all her, I, I, met, I had, um, I got rather drunk with some of her toilists, and um, they were saying, oh, today she said Le Corbusier, and walked out of the room, <laughs> and then. And uh, <coughs> so there was all these shutterboard concrete suits coming in the, uh, <laughs> yeah. But she really does say that. I mean, I'm a bit more, you know, literal. But, you know, I say, I really, I saw a great po a postman's, you know, in China, and he had this great pocket on, on you know, because he put all the mail in it, and I thought that would look really good on a suit, and... Uh, I would just describe it to the pattern maker and then hopefully it'll, you know, it comes about. I mean, this uh, is an artist palette I found in a, in a jumble set, you know, the thrift shop. And I, I, I photographed it and then turned it into buttons about this big, tiny little buttons. I just re had it, had it made into a button shape and, and used it on shirts and it was really it looked great. Uh, stamps. I love stamps. I have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of stamps. And um, I don't know why I collect them at all, really. But they're nice, aren't they? Um, actually, what I did with most of the stamps was I used them, uh, I, I pasted them onto the wall of some of the changing rooms in the various shops I've got. And it was, I used them for decoration. I just like them as uh, things. And I'll talk about this. If you think, remember this one where you've got the same. Uh, stamp. I'll talk about it a bit later. Uh, there's the tin. This, this is. Uh, I've got this thing about silly spectacles, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I was on the Great Wall of China with a bemused guide wearing these, and I, because I asked him if he'd take pictures of me on the wall, and he was very confused. I, I don't know why, but I've always had this thing about silly glasses. I really like them a lot. And the, um, I've had this thing about eyes, uh, and um, <coughs> I've done eyes painted onto belts, I've done 
Um, one day, for some reason, I thought it would be really good to paint the soles of, uh, uh, of my shoes with eyes on because I was invited on the bed with Paula Yates in breakfast TV. And I thought it would be really funny to be sitting on the bed and you put your feet up and then it said, good morning, and had eyes on the bottom. And she didn't know. And the camera loved it. It went straight up to there. And everybody said, oh, I love the shoes with the eyes. So I started painting eyes on the bottom of just cheap shoes I found in the, in the Portobello Road or something for five pounds. And we sold 60 pairs of shoes with eyes painted on the bottom. I mean, I, I've and they were all old shoes. I can't, I'm, it was just amazing. I can't, I can't imagine why people would have gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, anyway. And buttons with eyes as well. I've done buttons with that. This is the back of a fish tank, and I thought it might look good as a shirt, but I never did it. Um, this is a bunch of oranges, and I thought that might look good as a shirt. I do, I do um, as Piers knows, he has, he's the owner of quite a lot of my photographic print shirts. I mean, I, I really like photographic print. I found one printer in Italy that can print photographically exactly the image that you supply on the transparency. So I've done some really lovely things over the years, like you know, club sandwich shirts and spaghetti bowl shirts and things like that. And that's, that's where you take a photograph of the image and, and just literally turn it into a, a, a print. Um, this was in China as well. Uh, this is a lady who couldn't understand why I wanted to buy all the cigarettes and um, in fact called the police <laughs> for some reason just because I said I wanted all the cigarettes. I still have them here. I just love them and then I, 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 I just turned them into little things like, I mean I never sold these, I just did them for this talk. I mean, just put one in the top. Oh, sorry, one in the top pocket here. And I thought, you know, if you were James Dean, this is quite good, you now because you could have one like on your shoulder and then sort of roll it up and look really cool, like that, you know. <laughs> and one just on the front here. I mean, I wouldn't do these because you get first of all you get copyrighted. I mean, you wouldn't in, probably from China because I don't think they shop in Covent Garden. But the, you know, you, you might get you might get done for. Co you have to be very careful with putting images on on uh, t-shirts because of copywriting, incidentally. Anyway, that was, um, that was those. Um, photographic printing I've always loved and um, it's, it's something that I think work, works really well. And here, in, uh, you, you all know this because this is a bit of architecture, self-supporting dome, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> 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 By Le Capucier. <laughs> no? <laughs> Early work. <laughs> ah, I see, fooled you. <laughs> Very early work. Um, I like kitsch, you know, like bad taste things, and uh, I just think oh, that was quite funny. But I just suddenly walked into the car park at Pisa Airport, and there it was. Photorealism is, uh, is something that I've, I own quite a lot of photorealism. I just think it's fantastic. It's very sort of sexy sort of art, and it's uh, all done, mostly done with by airbrush, and it's something you don't really see anymore, but it was something that was extremely popular in the 70s. And uh, this book, if you ever see it, is fantastic. It costs 80 pounds these days, but it's a nice book. Um, all that went to this, the mini skirt. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I just thought it'd be really funny to put a mini on the skirt that was short. <laughs> so that was all based on photorealism. I rang up Mini and said, I want to print a mini on your skirt. And about 18 months later, when we've been through all the red tape, they let me do it. And it sold really quickly. It was fantastic. So that was all through the love of photorealism. Um, same with this. This look, maybe looks like he's wearing a, a rucksack or a backpack, but in fact, it's. Um, it's a rucksack I bought for, from Daphne's Handbags in Nottingham, which is a, a thrift shop for four pounds, and put it on some glass, photographed it very carefully with very, very sharp focus, and then sent it off to, to Italy to the printers and had one printed life size and then lots of little ones, and that's just printed onto the fabric. And it just, we used 19,000 meters of that fabric. It was so successful. Um, just because it's got this little visual trick uh, attached to it, which is nice. Um, print has been important for me over the years, and um, this was a you know 
this was a Kandinsky, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this was an influence of that. I mean, you must never copy uh, because there is a well. First of all, you must never copy because it's the wrong thing to do. But and also the, the thing is that um, you will get you know copyrighted anyway. So you can always use the influence of things. Um, when I was walking uh, down the road in uh, Covent Garden, I saw the uh, Sutton Seed shop, and um, that was the influence to the shirt, which um, was ever so popular. Oh, sorry, I only got one of that today. Yeah, well, and so I just... And I did this for a long time, 12 years ago, and it just, in fact, I mean, without being swell-headed, it really turned around the whole sort of print industry again because they were sort of not doing very well. And I came up with this shirt, and it was so influential and in lots of magazines that it, people started going back to, to printing things again, which was quite interesting. Um, these uh, have no particular significance. I just thought they're interesting things about u the use of colour. Like, I love that burgundy with the blue, and uh, that really fitted. I used a lot of burgundy with the Eve Klein blue that I showed you earlier. Um, this is a, another thing where I live. I think the sophistication of this um, blue with that brown is fantastic. And also how it's got little repairs on it. I mean, these days we throw away clothes. But, you know, a lot of people well, in China is, is you know, uh, and, and a lot of places uh, where they haven't got the money, they still repair things. I think that's really lovely, and I, I really like to see that. Uh, this is uh, very, very nice because it, I don't know if you've been to China, but uh, they all wear the name, uh, the brand name of uh, the label. They keep it on, on their cuff. <laughs> so um, uh, you see people walking along with Pierre Cardin dangling from their spectacles. <laughs> and it's like they're walking along, there's a label hanging off like this. Go, and it's like, um, and then all the suits they have, they have, you know, Cardan or Burberry or whatever still on, on there. So I thought it was fantastic. Um, I just liked him. I like this lovely, very nice. There are some really handsome people there, very nice. And this is, uh, they're, they're very into layering, you know. Uh, so this man has 18 layers on, probably. But there's a blue bit, a white bit a yellow bit and a black bit, that's four. They all wear lots of layers because it's very cold there and they just layer up and it's fantastically influential for somebody like myself because of how they put the colours together. Of course, they never think about them in the way I do, but I mean, it's such an influence and that was great. I mean, I, I got through so many rolls of film in, uh, in China. It was great. Um, the next bit is... is <coughs> He's talking about, I mean, it could be, any, I mean, it happens to be fashion we're talking about now, but it can be anything, is um, drawing attention to your work. And, um, you know, a lot of, uh, for instance, fashion editors, uh, shops, um, shop buyers, they, um, they just get so many invitations to fashion shows or to see a new collection um, uh, every week. I mean, I literally get 20, 30 things every uh, day on my desk, you know, for an invitation for a, f a private view or whatever. And I think it's really important to try and do something that was a bit different. So I was lucky enough to get Michelangelo to do one for me. And he, uh, this is an early, uh, early invite of mine. And I just, just using, I mean, I know I copied that, so don't tell, any, don't tell anybody. But always trying to do invitations which are different to others. This is, a, I was in, outside the Imperial Palace in, in uh, Japan uh, and in 1982, and I was the first <coughs> foreigner they'd ever seen, so that's why they're looking so astounded. Um, and I think the thing is, if you can get an invitation to drop on somebody's desk that is is interesting in some way, something that they might actually save and put on their wall and keep, then um, you know that's 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 fantastic. And something to is Paul Smith really about to launch the brush teak finish this season? Croaked the bemused editor. Um, this is by Glenn Baxter, who's a, you might know his work, he's a cartoonist. He wanted a suit and I wanted an invite, so it was very useful. Um, invitations, I think, uh, um, are something that you should not take too lightly because uh, as all of you are about to start at some point in your own business, um, it's, uh, it's something that you should try and think about, uh, how you present yourself right from the beginning. This is here for no reason at all, but I thought you might be getting bored, so I just put in a, a snake inventor joke. No. So more invitations. 
This is a donkey with a hot head. <laughs> this is in Karnak, in uh, Egypt. And uh, that was probably one of the most popular invitations I ever sent out. And uh, still, I still see it pinned on people's boards, you know. Uh, this was in 1984, so that just shows you how you can constantly promote your name within somebody's office or somebody's environment. And a lot of people actually frame them, you know. And I've got a lot of people who collect them. Um, <coughs> postcards um, are another thing which have been really fantastic. I've thousands of postcards, and um, f for one of my lines, I actually used them to put on the top of the socks just to make a regular sock look sort of different. So I bought 5,000 postcards from a, a man who had some dead stock in Dublin, and uh, <laughs> and I used them for the top of the socks, and they've been. Very, uh, people really love them. I mean, they, they hate the socks, but they love the postcards. <laughs> Oops. Um, this next bit um, is, um, I was waiting, uh, I had about four minutes to spare um, in Dometzano, which is a tiny village in, in, uh, in Tuscany. I was waiting uh, for somebody, and I, I just sort of was bored, and I just looked at the, I had my camera, and I just thought how it's just how everybody has something hanging from their mirror um, and it was just I just thought it was really unbelievable just everybody had something hanging from the mirror and um, I, in fact I could have included about uh, I think I took about 15 pictures in about four minutes and that ended up influenced me I I did these things here which are um, those horrible smelly things that you get in a taxi you know when you walk in and, and uh, I sent those out um, I love cycling, so I sent them out as an invitation, uh, influenced by my four minutes in Domitzano, uh because I saw things hanging off of uh, a mirror. So I, I sent them out as an invitation. And pe people luckily didn't undo them, so they didn't get the foul smell, but they really liked the invitations. So that's just back to observations and other stuff, you know, just things that are interesting. <coughs> um, this has no relevance to anything, but I was walking down a street in uh, somewhere, Urbino, uh, in Italy, and um, in about 30 seconds, I just thought it was interesting to see where they put their news the free newspaper. It was the same newspaper, and the inventive way that people had actually uh, well, that was a normal way, that was a letterbox, but uh, I just and I don't, I was just into things being uh, unusual, unusual things. I mean, like a tree growing in the top of a wall, or the uh, leaning bottle of Pisa. Which I, I bought 12 uh, water bottles uh, in Italy, and they were all leaning a whole lot. <laughs> Every one, they'd got faulty bottoms on them, and they're all they're all like that. So I, I just thought it was quite nice, seeing as I was about 40 minutes from Pisa. And also this wa the waving bottle opener, which was an interesting one, um, <laughs> which I, I happened to find. <laughs> Alessi have not done that yet. I mean, I'm just quite surprised. But um, this is um, just this was uh, by the uh, things hanging from a mirror. Uh, this was just a, I thought it was a lovely way that this man had decided, you know, decided how to cover up his tractor for the winter. So it's just a lovely little thing on wheels. And he, I don't know whether he wheeled the tractor out or wheeled the cover out. But anyway, it's just a nice thing. I thought. Um, I think I might just talk about these things for a second. Um, just, just on other things, this is um, a, a Christmas card I had that just came like that. It's a, just a, a, a rugby ball with lots of stamps on it and a dress. And I thought that was very clever. And I also, I, I received a piece of driftwood this, like this through the post. Um, so I just think that we, we can learn so much by just observing uh, clever people's minds. Uh, this is on the table because if you ever see any bad architecture you don't like, you just go <laughs> and it disappears. And this is very really useful. I've got rid of a lot of bad architecture, so I'll put that on there for that reason. Um, this is a basket which is made out of metro tickets, which is really lovely. And I just think, what a mind to, uh, to think of that. Uh, this is a clothes brush which has has love written on it, which I think if you're a brush manufacturer and you're thinking, how the hell can I sell more brushes? I know, I'll put love on the bottom. That's 
So, so um, elastic band manufacturers in Japan have uh, tried of uh, are selling more elastic bands because they've done them in lovely colours. Um, so even elastic bands you can make more interesting. And this uh, box, which is a handkerchief box, but is made like a, a, sh a top of a shirt. This is a lapel of a jacket, and that's a pocket. And then you poke the, poke the handkerchief out. And I think that's a really clever bit of packaging. All these things have helped me sort of think about interesting ways of uh, sending invitations out and Christmas gift brochures. This is a, um, one of my Christmas gift brochures, which is a vinyl record, and on it is printed ties and cufflinks, and inside is all the various things you can buy for Christmas, and on it I tell you what you can buy for Christmas. And it, this went in the British charts for about four minutes, because I, sold for, I made 14,000 of them, and it went into the British charts for about four minutes. So that was a uh, I was really pleased with that. Oh, so sorry. Uh, back to this. This is um, this is in Japan, where um, you've got to in, in a lot of the more uh, built-up areas, you've got to actually own um, a, a space for your car if you want to own a car. So I just love the way they cram everything in. And uh, this is a little lift idea, so they can get another car in there. They've got a the motorbike at the back and another car, and that's their entrance to the house. And um, that has been a big influence. Uh, seeing that slide has influenced a lot of the way I displayed in my shop, uh, cramming big things into small spaces, which I thought was, you know, just a, the proportion of it is really good. So I like that very much. This has also been a, a big influence in my shops, which is something so modern next to something so old. The contrast of the two, which I, again, is a, something I liked very much. Window dressing is really important for me uh, in my shop. And uh, you get about, you know, I don't know, how much test. If this is a shop window, you get about that much time of somebody's concentration to walk by your window. So if you can think of something that's quirky or funny to make people stop, then you're more likely to get an interest in your shop. So I always try to do funny windows um, and, and do things that make people smile. And a lot of that influence comes from all the stuff I've s you've seen on the table here. Um, this is a nice one because this was um, a, a different man won every day, the spectacles. I mean, today this man won the spectacles, but if he'd have walked by on the Thursday, this man would have won the spectacles. <laughs> so it was always, it, was, it depended which, you know, it was always changing. This is uh, some of the Christmas windows, for instance. So we got him the ventriloquist with a ventriloquist dummy. And uh, that's none of that is Paul Smith. But when you look closely here, you see that, uh, that there's a, a Paul Smith suit, shirt, and cufflink and watch offering him some Listerine, <laughs> which um, caused a lot of stir. Uh, but no, not as much stir as the eight-foot Yeti we had in the main shop window where this young man here is, d is talking to him and selecting a, a razor blade for the Yeti to uh, maybe shaving. But we've got other Christmas gifts in there as well. Um, kids shop, just funny, nice, giving this, this lovely photograph here. And um, it's a way of sort of stopping, you know, stopping people. Um, in the workwear shop we have around the corner called Newbold, we made a little video um, of, um, of a, a guy just walking along and coming into the shop and going, oh, Newbold, great, and then coming out, pleased. <laughs> so that was, a, that was our pleased loop. It was about 30 seconds long and it kept repeating itself. He came along as Santa Claus, went in the shop and came out completely head to toe in the clothes and was really pleased. And that, that a lot of people like that very much. Uh, uh, but the, the big hit was the wobbly mirrors window where you could actually place yourself under a Santa Claus hat and look extremely fat or thin. And that caused a hell of a, hell of a stir, especially when people were rather drunk on a Saturday night. And, you know, it was cool. So windows are really important. The way you shop, you know, the world is so full of shops, so full of so much that um, uh, 
you know, you're constantly trying to work out how to make your shop more interesting than others. No idea why that's there, sorry. Um, this uh, lady, this is her shop here on the top. That's her shop. So she has a, her shop is a, her briefcase and her bag, and she walks along the beach, and that's her shop. So she's worked out a way of having a shop with no overheads uh, and getting some sun. And I think that's very clever. She didn't sell me a t-shirt though. I sold her one. <laughs> <laughs> and two, actually. Um, I've, I, I started with shops uh, a long time ago. I was, I was a shop assistant in, in my hometown of Nottingham. And then I met Pauline and um, she gave me the confidence, my lady, um, she gave me the confidence to start my own shop and I s worked on my day off for about two years and saved up about £600 and um, opened a small shop in a back room and um, uh, I had to learn a lot about you know, to suddenly dealing with people like real, you know, estate agents I had to think about leases I had to think about shopkeeping and, oops, sorry, what went, and management and um, that was all very hard. Um, I, I had a, this tiny little shop in Nottingham f uh, for a long time, but I only opened it two days a week. And the reason I did that was because I was trying to still earn, an, earn a living from Monday to Thursday, but on the Friday and Saturday have this two days of purity where I could actually just sell what I wanted to sell. And that was really important for me, and I think that's something that, that uh, 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 an interesting bit of advice for, for you guys is that if you can earn some money doing jobs that you don't necessarily want to do, but you know that they're, it's about doing things you really do want to do, then that's fantastic. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I used to sell shirts, I used to uh, work as an agent selling suits, I used to <coughs> be a colourist for uh, Benetton in the early days of Benetton, I used to do anything to earn money and Friday and Saturday were my two days of purity with no compromise at all and because I didn't compromise because I basically had a shop that was full of clothes that nobody wanted because they were all exactly opposite to what people wanted, you know. They all wanted flares and I only had narrow bottoms and they all wanted, you know, um, baggy shirts and I only had narrow shirts or whatever, I can't remember. But anyway, it was exactly opposite what I had. But eventually people slowly, slowly, slowly got to know what I did for a living that they were interesting and they used to come from different towns and uh, eventually, you know, sometimes from Scotland down to Nottingham where in the middle of England and, and buy from me. And I did that for uh, quite a long time, and then eventually I thought I should come to London. And uh, London is um, where this shop is. This was the first shop in Covent Garden. Um, I, I ended up in Covent Garden because I couldn't afford to be anywhere else. Um, I thought foolishly I could be in Chelsea or wherever, uh, but I didn't realise the rents were so stupidly expensive. I eventually went to Covent Garden and it was completely empty. By that time all the fruit and vegetable market had moved away. and. Um, <coughs> At that time, I was a real lover of the, of the Bauhaus and, uh, and the whole sort of minimalist uh, Corbusier movement. And, uh, and uh, so I was trying to find a shop that was actually very minimal. And uh, I eventually found 44 Floral Street in Covent Garden, which um, sadly these days is far too cluttered and doesn't look minimal at all. And I apologise for that. But in the beginning, it, do it, did, look, it did look very nice. And um, uh, in the evening, um, because it's in the theatre district, in the evening, we, 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 um, I wanted to make out my shop like a theatre, so we put a screen in that you could wind down and project onto at night. This is the screen halfway down. So I had my own little bit of theatre. And in fact, that was, been, that was the uh, beginning of me doing interesting windows um, uh, that really used to stop people in their tracks. And it was lovely because I could actually react to uh, occasions, like if something had happened in the world that I wanted to sort of make it my own little comment on, I could actually do it that night, and that was fantastic. Um, this is uh, the back projection in operation where we're, we're projecting an image onto, onto the screen. And it caused a lot of stir. I actually found 44 Floral Street by looking through letterbox, uh, letterboxes, because the whole of the Covent Garden was shuttered up 
with concrete shutters and you couldn't see, uh, with um, metal shutters and you couldn't see anything. And at that time, a lot of the shops around were pine and pine floor and wood boards, and I didn't like that. And so I just used to go around in the evening with a torch looking through letterboxes and eventually found this shop. 44 Floral Street that was concrete because it was been bombed in the war and it had been rebuilt in 58 out of the cheapest material which was concrete and so I actually found a shop that really um, that really suited the bill um, but then you'll go boo hiss because I start I changed the style of the shops into a, a more sort of traditional style and that was because of of uh, 43 Floral Street, which is the shop next door, which uh, was built in 1850 and is just full of wood. And I just literally didn't have the heart to rip it out. So what I did was buy lots of old fittings of mahogany fittings that were just uh, from old tailor shops and chemists and actually fitted it out with, uh, with those fittings. And those, that uh, started off to be the sort of the way the Portsmouth shops were around the world. Uh, although my love is still, you know, with the modern, um, this became something that was um, uh, linked to, to Paul Smith. The the thing I these pictures are about showing you that I it's, I think it's really important not to have a shop that's just um, full of clothes but things that make you smile or things that are interesting these are magazines from Fran uh, from America called Fortune magazines there's uh, um, albums you know, vinyl from uh, Sex Pistols or uh, Clash all sorts of things there's always something to, to um, pick up on and um, th it's all about basically these this is a symbol of balance this is all getting the balance right between your shop because basically your shop if you have a shop the reason I'm so successful, especially in Japan, is the fact that I've always there's always something to find in a Paul Smith shop. You always go in there, and there's always something new. We sold uh, Lambrettas, we sold Vespers, we sold old vinyl, we sold photographic books, masses of things. So there are so many shops in Japan. You cannot believe it's so crowded, but there are all over the world these days. But people still come in the shop because there's always the unknown. These are all bound volumes of the Face magazine that we that we sold in here. One of the things that I've noticed with, uh, with interior design and architecture recently that's uh, linked with shops is that it's very clear, especially uh, with a lot of uh, the very minimalist architects, that they've never ever worked in a shop because they're just, uh, nobody, uh, so many people don't realise the function of a shop. Uh, that you need to wrap things up, that you need to put a credit card through, that you need to answer the phone, that in a closed shop you have alterations that are pinned and they've got to be put somewhere and sent off to the tailors. And also, if you're showing people shirts or knitwear, you've got to have somewhere to show them, so you pull them out of the rack, and so many shops these days, there's nowhere to put them. So you find the shop assistant balancing uh, shirts on their knees or something. So, I mean, if you get asked to... to uh, design a shop or a bar or uh, anything work in it be there work in it you've got to work in it you've got to know what the demands are because you'll get things hopelessly wrong I've seen so many problems the John Paulson shop in New York the uh, 1500 pound uh, Calvin Klein um, dress that John uh, you know in the Madison Avenue shop are all hanging on the on the floor by this much 1500 pounds each because the rails are too low and there's no adjustment on them. I mean, and it's just basic stuff. You know, I love John's work, but it's basic stuff. Anybody who's doing shop or bar have got to work. You've got to work in the shop. You've got to hang out there. You've got to know what you're doing because otherwise you'll get it wrong. Here's the stamps. That's where a lot of the stamps ended up inside the changing rooms just to make the changing rooms look different to other people's. Um, also, even the open and closed signs, you know, they're all different. Instead of getting a sort of dumb, sort of plastic sign, um, you know, you, they can be inventive, they can be special. So even a, the, the detail of, of an open and closed sign. I've got lots of visual jokes in my shop. Uh, um, the, I've got a lot of trompe l'oeil uh, in, in the shop. And uh, this is in the Japan shop, there's a £20 note uh, on the staircase. Uh, in the Paris shop, uh, we have a... <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, we parish shop, um, we've got a, a 200 franc note and the reason there's a, a, a six inch nail in it is because um, it was getting so embarrassing when customers would uh, just walk along and they'd be going... <laughs> <coughs> and then scrape their fingernails and 
till blood appeared and realised that it was painted on the floorboard. So we put a bloody great big six-inch nail in and said, it's a joke, OK? Just get it, relax. <laughs> and um, we've got gloves on the floor by the mirror. We've got a Louis Vuitton purse in the changing room with money spilling out of it. We've got a, a nail on the floor, on the wall with car keys on it. And it just causes so much fun. And I just think that, you know, shops are... There's so much in the world, so much product, so much of everything, that you've got to make yours a bit more special than somebody else's. And I mean, maybe you don't like the way I do it, but it, it, the principle is, is the key thing. Like Dave Wax. I mean, Dave Wax has really got it because he knows... All our suits have character, your character. <laughs> have you looked in your wardrobe lately? <laughs> so you see, I, where's John Paulson tonight? Is he here? Look, this is what he needs. He needs signs in his window, and I think that's it. Now, the reason the chicken's here is, is because... Uh, the reason I have a big business in Japan is because of this uh, chicken here. <laughs> Uh, and the other reason I have a big business in Japan is these red loops. So, <laughs> the two reasons I have a big business in Japan are these things here. You might ask yourself why. I have no idea. No, I have really. Uh, no, the reason I have a big business in Japan is because somehow I've worked out how to communicate. Um, I've been there 41 times. Uh, in the early days, I used to go there and have... Well, first of all, I went with the right attitude. People, often businessmen, come up to me and say, how come you've got such a big business in Japan? It's a 106 million quid business in Japan now. And um, they say, how come you've got such a big business? And well, first of all, you know, I always enjoyed going there. I don't worry about the plane journey. I don't worry about the jack lag. I love the food. Most businessmen hate all of those things, and they arrive completely negative. So that's a bad start. The other thing is um, I've managed to... I love the people, I love the culture, and I've tried to work out how to, how to work with their culture but still keep Paul Smith. And um, in the early days, I'd be at a dinner with 22 people and only one person would speak a little bit of English. And um, I learnt from my father, who's 93 years of age now, um, uh, through his personality... Um, I've succeeded in Japan um, because of a sense of humour. And um, he, we used to go to, when I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, I used to go to, you know, auntie's houses and you'd have to go there and walk into a room with all the family there, with cousins and everything, and I'd be so shy and embarrassed. And in about two minutes, my dad had got it sorted out and everybody was laughing and everybody was relaxed. And through silly things that you all might think are very stupid, and you've got to get the timing right, because bringing out a chicken at the wrong meeting ain't <laughs> sensible, I can tell you. So I'm not suggesting you all go with dead chickens immediately, but it's always happy, ha handy to have one in your briefcase. Um, I was at Com Com de Gasson party, um, Com de Gasson at the big posh fashion house in, in Japan, and Ray Karakuba, the boss, is a friend of mine. I was invited in 1982 to her fashion show, and I was the only foreigner there. And afterwards, there was a party where everybody looks very seriously at the video and is very concerned that it was all perfect. And, I, and then there's a, a party, but it's a party in inverted commas because everybody's really quite serious. But I get um, the warehouse lads very drunk in the corner. And uh, by chance, I happened to have 22 pairs of rubber lips in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, and we, uh, we had the most fantastic photograph at the end where, you know, there, was, uh, there were just like this. But they were giggling so much, they were going... <laughs> and they were trying to switch out. And we got this fantastic picture. And slowly, this sort of mad John Cleese myth has built up about the whole sort of, you know, Paul Smith and the English nurse. And, and then I'd be having a meeting and i get bored and I'd just say, I'm really bored with this meeting, I'm off for lunch. And, and they'd go, oh, like this, and then think it was fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, the other big asset has been the barking bone which I have actually taken the battery of, out of because it really drives you mad. But this is a bone that barks when you nudge it, and that's also been very helpful in a lot of meeting. <laughs> so basically, the thing what I'm trying to, why I'm showing this is because it's just, 
you know, life's short. Uh, if you get the timing right, you can enjoy, you can loosen people up and have a successful business because you've got a sense of humour, you make people feel relaxed and listen to what my dad did because he was great. Um, I think uh, the other thing, I'm, uh, this is a, a, an obscure s section of the talk. Uh, I've never done this talk really like this before, so sorry, you know, it's not, I'm not flowing very well because I don't really know it well. Um, I love repeated images, I think they're very powerful. You know when I said to you earlier about the stamps, where love, 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 love. I just think that, you know, look how strong that looks. It's fantastic. And um, often in my windows I'll put, you know, six of, the seven sh uh, six of the same orange shirt together or we'll block the whole, you'll walk into one of my shops and the whole wall will be blue or the whole wall will be green or if you go like a, you know, to a metro station you see Avian ad and it goes all the way down the station. So the power of a repeated image I think is very important and um, that probably could even relate to architecture windows or something, I don't know, I just thought I'd show you it because I like it. Um, this is, um, uh, I'm fascinated by just ingenu people's ingenuity and people's ideas and sense of humour. Uh, this is a photograph of Archer House. Uh, this is a photograph of Ledbury House. And the next photograph is a photograph of Denby House uh, in Notting Hill Gate. <laughs> the big house. I just thought it was very clever, but they've replaced it now. But some wise guy had um, taken it out a few. This is, um, this is a picture of... Um, Croft original, uh, where obviously somebody didn't like the fact that she was shown too much chest and graffitied over it. And I couldn't find the before, but this was the after of the other one. You probably remember those. Um, I don't know why I put those in. I just thought they were, it was interesting that people were worried about chests. Um, <laughs> too much choice. Um, the next bit of the talk, which is luckily for you, is the coming towards the end is that, I mean, you know, I, I, have, uh, I have 300 staff in Britain and I've got offices in all over the place, you know, Dusseldorf, Mil um, Madrid, Milan, Paris, New York, Japan. You know, just my wage bill here is 2.4 million quid. It's a lot of responsibility because basically I'm a designer but I happen to own the business as well. And it's uh, quite, you know, a lot, lot of work. And the world is just, there's just so much selection now in the world of clothes, of everything. So it's how you, you have all that responsibility on your shoulders, but how do you make your business just a little, more, little bit more special than other people's? And that's the key to success. How do you make your building design just a bit more special, more functional, better priced, good quality, but quirky or interesting or whatever? <laughs> Difficult job. But anyway, this, this, is, uh, this is part of a little talk I did to all the posh m magazine editors. Uh, in London. It was very scary because they give me lots of free editorial in magazines and they invited me to, to criticise, constructively criticise them, which was quite a hard job. So I just looked at how many magazines there are and how similar they all look, which it could be how many buildings there are, how many restaurants there are, how many airlines there are, how many clothes shops there are. So basically this, the, choi the, the problem's the same. And I, w I thought Berwick Street and I thought, well, if you're, a if you're selling fruit and vegetables, nearly always fruit and vegetable shops are all together. Portobello Road, Berwick Street, the Ramblas in Barcelona, where, uh, wherever you want to go, Covent Garden Market. So I, w walked down, um, I walked down Berwick Street and just taking pictures of, of uh, tomatoes. And I was thinking, how, how does one guy sell more tomatoes than the other guy when you've all got a stall and nothing else to show your w wares? tomatoes with stalks. That's how you can sell more because he's got stalks and these don't have stalks. Now I thought that's very clever because he's, he's found a way of making his look more natural, more... There's always a way, you see, of getting something going. But as you walk along, you then also look at, at the display, which is back to my window dressing. So this is quite a messy stall and this is a very neat and tidy stall. <laughs> So which one's better? I don't know. He probably sells more because it looks perceived value is better, you know. But this is the next one, is the king, because he did display. <laughs> you see? Yeah. So, neat and tidy, tomatoes with stalks and display. 
So if you want to get on in the world, that's just some useful information. Um, the next bit is um, talking to the same editors is um, how I find uh, all the magazines' uh, covers really boring these days. And um, they're all about girls with very few clothes on. Uh, and it's just getting all so samey. As you saw, the big pile of magazines. So I, I went into my sort of archives, 1959, and looked at some covers and looked at how special covers used to be, but now they're so linked to that corporate stuff about oh, how many circulation we've got and how many m the advertisers and how much we must pe get paid for. And there's no bravery anymore. I mean, it's so sad that everybody's so linked into the same sameness. And uh, I mean, that was uh, me criticising these guys, but it was, it was quite, a, you know, quite a hard thing to do. Um, and they, they just, they were just so much more special. I mean, Esquire magazine now would probably have, you know, uh, a girl in a bikini and not dogs in hats. <laughs> Look at that one. Fantastic. Illustration, when's that? 19, oh, I don't know. I didn't say. Oh, yeah, 59, 1959. Um, do you know, oh, you probably know about him. Uh, Brodovich was a, an art director in New York who was just so um, that's not his work incidentally I just thought I'd put it up for the hell of it this is his work I mean this is um, this was a, an art director that was so brave in New York working for Harper's Bazaar and um, just coming up with stuff that was so different to what you'd seen around before and this is a photograph by a, a lady called Lillian Bassman who was the first woman to actually um, Hand, tint, hand paint onto photography. So photograph, mixing photograph and, and hand tinting. And somebody like uh, Brodovich being brave enough to actually use him and to, to do something about, you know, about these uh, bland magazines. This is uh, Andy Warhol and Avedon together, illustration, <coughs> illustration and photography. And again, so brave and something, sadly, you just don't see like you used to do anymore. Uh, the other thing is advertising as well. I mean, this is a Scotch tape advert. I just think it's so bold and so brave and so minimal. And this is, uh, I don't know when, 50-something, 1950, maybe before, I don't know. And it's just got the name Scotch written in here. And it's such a, such a powerful image. Um, this is a forklift truck advert. I mean, it's just, just great stuff, you know, and, and, and very brave. Um, basically, it's all coming to the, the talk's coming to the end because this is, um, it, what I'm trying to say, that the observations of other stuff, it's all there if you want it. You know, just use your eyes and you can find anything. And even a shoelace can be reinvented. This is a self-tying shoelace for kids because they just roll it in the hand and it ties itself. Um, but the grand finale has got to be um, a sewing kit because I, I had breakfast with Tony Blair last Tuesday and uh, I was saying, he invited me for breakfast and I said, sure. And he, uh, <laughs> I didn't eat any breakfast because he kept me talking so much. And I had to go and have a breakfast afterwards. But, um, <laughs> and it's true, actually, that is true. But, but no, I, I, saw, I, I was invited because of my um, passion about getting design taken more seriously. And um, I keep saying, you know, we're devoted to design education in this country, but we don't seem to be devoted to using it. And that you've got to promote the fact that, um, you know, design can turn into jobs and into money. It really can, and you've got to do it. And I said, you've got to get this myth out of your head that all designers have got, are eccentric and got green hair and go purple. <laughs> and I nearly, <laughs> I nearly knocked his orange juice over at that point because I went purple and his orange juice was there and, um, and you've got to get that out of your head you know because there's a lot of just regular people out there that are just you know design is about anything I said design is about a pencil it can be a pen you know a pencil has to be designed and I said sewing kit now he, if you're a sewing kit manufacturer third generation and you think, what the hell can I do with a sewing kit? You know, how can I make my sewing kit be better than somebody else's? And the answer is this one, which we're 
the needle is already threaded for you. You see, there's always a way. There's always a way. Um, that dog says thank you on its collar, so thank you. And um, before you do anything, if you want to ask questions, because this is the end of the talk, but stay there a minute. Um, if you want to ask questions, which you're always scared to do, but I have prizes for questions. <laughs> you see? So I'm going to get questions. So, look at that. Sexy shirt, really. And we've got a roving mic somewhere, and if anybody's got questions, this is a hat. You have to roll it, and they, you know, and go, yo, a lot. Yes, yes. yes. Yo, like that. This uh, makes it into a hat somehow. So we've got, look, 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 nice, pr we've got a girl's top. <laughs> So I didn't forget you girls. We've got a tie with a toaster on it. No, an iron, sorry. Anyway, if anybody's got any questions, I'll give you a present. Uh, and if you want to go, that's fine, because you're probably tired and got sore bottoms. Uh, anybody got a question? For a top? Here we are. <laughs> Do you want to shout or, oh, I think you have to speak into that, I'm afraid. No? Uh, I mean, you've got the Paul Smith made in England. I mean, how, obviously that's important to you, but like, does that influence your design, the, the Englishness and the, I mean, do you promote that abroad or? Right. The young lady saying, um, I'm, I've got Paul Smith made in England and how important is that and do I promote that? Um, I mean, the, all of our clothes are not all made in England anymore, just sadly because we just literally can't find enough manufacturers um, to, to do the sort of quality sometimes. I mean, that's another thing I was talking to Blair about in all seriousness, is just the fact that a lot of factories haven't reinvested, they're not modern, they've got the wrong attitude, they don't understand. Um, um, so, but the bulk of the clothes are still made in Britain and we won the Queen's Award to export, you know, which Piers said earlier. Um, it's, it's the Britishness is more important, I think. The fact that um, hopefully you'll get the drift of... Uh, you know, tradition, cla craftsmanship, but with a, a sense of humour, and I think that's the important thing. So that's that, that's that. Do you want to come and get a present, or shall I throw you something? What would you like? A, 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 hmm? Something? The hat? Yeah, why not? I'll keep your head warm tonight. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else brave enough? Oh yeah, the man in blue, and then the lady. Do you want the microphone? Huh? Do you want the microphone? No, no, I'm okay. Uh, you talk very graphically about your, your way, way of designing, but do you ever think about uh, you know, the spatial qualities of, of your <laughs> <laughs> Is this an architectural question? <laughs> I love, I'm very, it's all about balance and proportion <laughs> and rhythm. <laughs> it's about rhythm and proportion. Window, window, door. Pocket, pocket, tie. <laughs> pocket, pocket, tie. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to design three-dimensionally because people go that way as well, and that's why, um, that's why I design on the stand with a toile because that way you can get the three-dimensional effect straight away. Because I can't draw, it's actually turned to my advantage because I make the, literally make everything in uh, calico, which is cheap uh, cream fabric, on the stand, and that obviously is three-dimensional. I mean, actually, I have because I do have a, a strong interest in architecture and in painting. Pauline, my missus, is a painter these days, and so proportion and uh, perspective and uh, the use of colour, they're all such important things, and I actually apply a lot of those to clothes. And I think the important thing, when you're dealing with simplicity, which I am, um, uh, what you're, that word you used is really important. Uh, does that sort of answer your question? or? Yeah. No. Would you like a, a, a gift? Uh, <laughs> a check shirt? Check shirt or a tie with the iron on it? Yeah, certainly. Now there's a lady at the back there in black. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. All oh, right, very good question. How did I um, 
feel about my uh, label in the mid to late 80s becoming attached to yuppiedom. I loathed it, hated it, and uh, the whole problem about discovering the file effects and the boxer short, it was such a, a burden. And what I did was start doing a lot more strong, bold fashion shows because people were using, saying Paul Smith and Ralph Lauren is a mo you know, in the same breath, and it was real big burden around my neck. And so I really started to go back to the drawing board, think again about how to make things in a more interesting way, more fashionable way, use colour a lot more. Uh, and I, I was very brave. I, did a f I, I had a very good business. It was modest business, tiny business, but it was quite good. And then um, I was showing like a tr more traditional environment, maybe a room like this <coughs> with regular good-looking models, and it was all very simple. And then I got really fed up of, of that link, and, and so uh, I knew Andre Putman. You know, I don't know if you know her. She's a designs <coughs> designs things, and she had a, a very minimal gallery in Leal in Paris. And I borrowed it for an afternoon. I used only black models. I used all completely bright chitin blue, raspberry colour suits and clothes. I played only dub music and it scared the life out of all my customers and I nearly <laughs> lost them all. <laughs> it was so scary. Uh, but then I brought out the chicken and there was no problem. Uh, <laughs> no, and, and then eventually they came back to me because they realised I had got a point of view and uh, it ended up being probably the best season I'd ever done. So it was something that... The thing with, with fashion, architecture, restaurants, aeroplanes, you've never made it. Never, never, never made it. I mean, I don't think of myself as a successful designer. I just think I'm doing really well, uh, but it's all about tomorrow. It's all about tomorrow. Because if you want to put your back in the chair and relax and think, wow, I've been on the telly, I've been in vogue, that's when everybody's overtaking you and it's horrible. And I don't want to be a failure. Would you like a gift? <laughs> I don't have a mini-mini. I have um, a rather attractive male shirt, a shiny shirt, which is enormous, a hat, a large selection of toothbrushes, a girl's blouse, I mean top thing. It's stretchy. Yes, sure, sure. Could anybody pass the shiny shirt back, please? It's coming that way. Thank you. Okay, sorry. You said you never studied fashion. Is that for you first to seem to be marking fashion design? No, 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 I'm not. Ma the gentleman who said that I never studied fashion, um, am I adverse to it? And that I was mocking them. But I wasn't mocking them at all. I'm not. I mean, I work a lot. I mean, I was had. Um, it's week we had Glasgow, didn't we? School of Art? We had 30 students from Glasgow School of Art last week. Um, I always give a lot of time over to, to f not just fashion uh, design students, but you know, product design students. I've done projects with lighting design. No, no not at all. I think uh, if you can have the, I mean, I, I, I had a very poor education, just generally, it's terrible. I still can't speak proper like what you can. And, uh, uh, and I left school at 15, and I would have loved to have had a better education, both. Uh, school education and, and fashion uh, education, but I didn't. So, I mean, I probably am doing okay just because I've had to learn how to do it, but absolutely no. I think you should, you should go through it and try and... What, the only thing I think you should try and do is, is get, like, Saturday jobs or, you know, weekend jobs or work in the evening because that way you, you have to get the balance between the education and reality of life. Do you want, do you want to get a Prezi? Come, come. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Is it your size, though? <laughs> <coughs> okay, sorry. No, because they're free. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I, uh, the gentleman asked me if I wear anybody else's clothes. I, I mean, I get them free, so who would you? <coughs> um, I, um, I wear Comme de Gasson sometimes because I get them free too. <laughs> what would you like, a t-shirt or a shirt? Yeah, okay. Here they come. <coughs> okay, that lady there. Uh, everything's under my name, the lady said, and uh, how much credit do I give to the rest of the team? Um, the thing is, first of all, if I explain why everything's under my name, because I, for six years I worked in a clothes shop in Nottingham, in my hometown, 
which was called Birdcage. Don't laugh. <laughs> All right, laugh. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog. Um, uh, during the period when I worked as a shop assistant, the trend for shop names then were all silly names like Doll's House, Bird Cage, Guys and Dolls, whatever. So when I started my own shop, there were two reasons why I called it Paul Smith. One, because a lot of people knew I'd been managing the shop before, so I thought that would, they would recognise the name. And the other thing was just to be more modern, you know. So that's how I came to use the name. Um, at that time, there was just Pauline and myself, so it was just two people, so it wasn't really a problem. Um, nowadays, I do have a huge team, and uh, I, can't, I can't include their names because it just confuses people, to tell the truth. I mean, you know, I've tried selling young designers' clothes in my shop, and people say, well, why? It's a Paul Smith shop. Well, why have you got young designers' clothes? So all, all I can say is that hopefully that we have a happy team and a happy, you know, environment, and, and I think it's true that we do. But I think it's a good point. And would you like a hat, a T-shirt, or a shirt, or a tie, or a toothbrush? One hat. It's not a very... Well, <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> <coughs> um, this young man, then you. Uh, so what's the main question is what... What is the discrepancy between what is shown in high fashion yep. and what is actually marketed, what is sold? What, what, what's the yeah, effect the you having on mainstream fashion? Right. I mean, the gentleman is asking about um, what the difference is between, say, for instance, what you see on here and what people buy and what is in the shops. Is that right? You, you yourself wear it, yeah, sure. I'm old, though, you know, so... <laughs> yeah. I, I can't go around, yo. <laughs> Check it out, man. <coughs> um, uh, anybody got a hand, uh, an elastic band? <laughs> um, I, mean, I just explained about fashion shows. I mean, fashion shows basically you, you spend about between seventy and ninety thousand pounds in twenty minutes for a fashion show. You have them twice a year. They happen to be in Paris, mine, because there's a lot of buyers and press go to Paris. Um, I'm not involved in the London Fashion Week because that's women's, and at the moment I don't show my women's collection. You've got a task in 20 minutes, about 20 minutes. One side of your catwalk is our buyers, and they own shops around the world, and we sell in 40 countries, 39, 40 countries. On that side are all press, so Vogue's and L's, and, but not from all over the world. So in 20 minutes, you've got the task of trying to show the press that you're moving forward, you've got new ideas, this is the new silhouette, it's all about colour, it's about flowers, it's about whatever, 20 minutes. And you've got 20 minutes to show all your buyers that the cash register will ring if they buy Paul Smith clothes, and you're moving forward and you've got new ideas. So obviously, you, on, the, on the catwalk, you've got to show things that are slightly more special because you know, you've, they, they're being photographed and filmed and... That's the reason. All the clothes we show are for sale, that people can buy them. But at the end of the day, I mean, we've only got to look around the room here, uh, and most of us human beings wear quite simple clothes, in fact. Uh, and um, the, 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 apart from yourself, <laughs> <laughs> he looks extremely modern. <coughs> I think you look great in a long frock. <laughs> no, I think you look, no, no, you look good. No, I mean, it's just that, you know, ish. No. So that's the answer, really. What would you like? Uh, no, but it's a oh, sorry. No. <laughs> How do you feel about this? Because it's an art form, and it's sort of a... Well, absolutely. The first thing is I don't think of clothes as an art form at all. I think I make clothes for a living, and, you know, people spill soup down them or wear them or crease them. I, I think, you know, I just make clothes because I enjoy being a designer. It's a great lifestyle. Um, and uh, I don't think of them as an art form at all. I think Issey Miyake may be quite rightly thinks of his clothes as an art form because they're very sculptural and very beautiful. Uh, but mine, I think, of just of, of uh, jobs, uh, uh, clothes that do a job. They make you feel cool, sexy, business-like. I always think it's cool. A lot of people say to me, you know, about the importance of, of uh, fashion design. And I say, well, it's as important as you want, really. But, I mean, it, would be, it is quite an interesting thought to get on a jumbo jet and find that the pilot has got a hat on back to front and Bermuda shorts and is going, yes, check it out, I'm driving today, how are you doing? <laughs> <coughs> but because he's in a very smart uniform and looks very important, in fact, he's actually like I've just described on his day off, I mean, you wouldn't, you'd feel very nervous about him driving that plane. Or going to your bank manager and he was dressed as a punk. 
and had pink hair and he, and he, you know, it, he was completely qualified and you were going for a mortgage and he could give you one, but he had, you know, blue hair and he's going, hi, how you doing, you know, and playing sex pistols. I mean, so I think it, the clothes do do a job because, I mean, they make you feel, you know, special. So I think hopefully what I do with my clothes is you buy into my clothes and you show your personality through them. That's why, in fact, the simplicity is important. I think a lot of the uh, clothes these days, um, people are buying into the image of the... Because so many of the clothing companies are, are, are marketing-led these days, you know, if you wear... Uh, I don't know, I can't think of it. You know, none of you would wear it, but, for instance, Chanel. Um, uh, all right, I know you wouldn't wear it. I'm just using it as a for instance. If you wear Chanel, then you are saying, you know, I am fashionable, I am rich. But that's what you're saying. But hopefully what you do in my clothes is you say, I am me, you know. So you can wear, I mean, I'm, you know, just wearing simple clothes because I happen to, I think that reflects my personality because my personality is bubbly, so I don't need clothes to say I'm bubbly because I do it with my mouth, as you've heard. Is that right? Do you want a shirt? Do you want a really boring old shirt? <laughs> oh, God. Sorry about this. Would you like a zebra instead? <laughs> Is that all right for you? Yeah, sure, I'll come to your office. Yeah, I'll, sw I'll, I'll swap you. Okay, the lady at the back. Uh, <laughs> what is the new black? <laughs> the lady said, can, she, can I clear up some confusion? What is the new black? I thought she was actually saying, could you clear up some confusion? <laughs> I thought you were Issey Miyake. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, brown, darling. Dark brown is the new black. So... Would you like a dark brown tie or a toothbrush? Or a <laughs> I've, I haven't got much left, really. I'm running out. I've got a, a, a top. No, that's mine. Sorry. <laughs> you see the business go down in Japan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Smith fails in Japan. I've got a very boring tie. I've got a tie with a toaster on it, a toothbrush or a stretchy top. Okay, here we go. I've got about four, a few things. Have we got time still, Piers? Are we okay? Oh, for questions? Right, yeah. Okay, this side, because I've not done it this side. Hi. <laughs> sorry about this side. I completely forgot. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I apologise. I'm actually interested in your shop Right. Right. So the lady's asking, um, when she goes into the shop, she finds a lot of antique pieces and unusual watches and strange pieces and things, and do I collect them myself or do we have a team? And the answer is both, really. Um, <coughs> we have... Um, I, I go to a lot of street markets around the world when I'm travelling around and find all this stuff and photograph things and find lots of things. I mean, like my watch... Uh, which is uh, sort of very sort of 70s. I mean, uh, although this was not copied from everything, it was influenced by just looking at uh, watches, you know, in, in street markets and things. Uh, we, have, we have a team of, of people who, part of their job, not full-time, part of their job is just to find nice things around the world. It's a lovely job. I mean, we've had Pete Stevens gone to places like... We've had guys go to, you know, Hungary with £5,000 in the carrier bag and say, buy something fabulous. And... And uh, it's a nice job, but um, sometimes they don't find anything, you know. Yeah, well, um, she's asking if I get uh, involved in the selection of all the things. Um, basically, most things, even in Kyoto or Paris, I've seen at some point because they come through the central buying room in Covent Garden. So at some point I've, I'll see most of the things, not everything, but most of the things. And by now I've got a, which goes back to the team question that the lady asked earlier, is uh, by now I've got a good team of people that really know what I like and what I don't like, so they've actually got their sort of heads around it now. So um, I think that's the answer really. Is that right, John, to something? The zebra? I'm sure we can, so there we are. No, not that, I'm really not supposed to give those away, but I will do to you. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, uh, gentleman in the back is asking about, uh, I'm well known for clothes uh, designer for men, but recently I've done women's, and what's the difference? The difference is nightmare. 
I mean, uh, the difference is completely different. I mean, like, it yeah, it's so, de designing for women and men is just completely different. The women's wear business is five times bigger in turnover than the men's business. Not mine, worldwide. And it's very fickle and it's very press related and uh, it's just very competitive. And it's, it changes a lot more because basically, you know, the, the, the things about men is that the, it's mostly about, you know, jackets, shirts, trousers. Obviously, the silhouette changes, but uh, with women, it's, it's very different. And uh, something which is very hard to keep up with, but we're getting there. We've got 30 shops in Japan, and we've got 11 million pound business in women's now. So slowly, slowly, I'm getting there. I've got a tie. You're not allowed any more from here. She's nicked my zebra. So you can have a, a tie or a watch. or I mean, no, not a watch. <laughs> <coughs> a slip of the tongue. You can have a toothbrush or a tie. One for your girlfriend as well. There's two here. Yeah. Can you pass them back to him? Anything else before my voice goes? This young lady here. <coughs> the the clothes in uh, ladies asking if the clothes are cut differently for Japan. Un, uh, most people just think you cut two inches off the bottom of everything, but it's not true. <laughs> You have to, it's, it's an absolute nightmare uh, in the beginning, was a nightmare in the beginning because they had to reproportion everything. Uh, but now we've got a standard, what they call block patterns, they call them blocks. Uh, we've got a, sa a standard set of blocks now. <coughs> and uh, so we sort of know what we're doing now. I think I'm going to have to stop because my voice is going. Um, sorry, I can't. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <coughs> no. Okay. <laughs> ah, it's all right, sorry, my voice is back. <laughs>